All right, a uh, minute after the top of the hour, I think it's about time to get started. So hello everyone, welcome to this webinar today's session. Hope you're each having a great day. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Uh, my name is Colleen Berry. I'm the marketing director for Burwood Group and I'll be your host for today's session. A quick heads up that we are recording. Uh, we'll be sending a recording of this event to all of the registrants after today's session. So today's topic is approving alerting and notifications in manufacturing. We'll be talking about keeping workers informed and safe throughout manufacturing facilities and campuses. The highlight of this event uh, is certainly our interview with Miller Electric. We're thrilled to have them on today to talk about some real world use cases uh, and what they've done with single wire Informacast in their facilities. So uh, since that's the highlight, let's jump right into introducing our speakers, Pat from SingleWire and Mark from Miller Electric. Pat, can you begin? Yeah, thanks, Colleen. My name is Pat Sheckle, and I'm responsible for product management and marketing here at SingleWire Software. Great. Thanks, Pat. And Mark, a little bit about yourself. Thanks, you guys. Um, my name is Mark Tilkins. I've uh, worked at Miller Electric Manufacturing for 35 years in IT and happy to uh, demonstrate and answer questions about how we use single wire in our company. Excellent. Thank you both. Mark, we're glad to have you here with us today. So let's do a quick overview of today's agenda. We will start with Pat giving us a brief level set on the primary technology that Miller Electric has implemented for their alerting system, which is single wire and formicast. Get into capabilities, use cases, and more. And then we'll dive right into a back and forth discussion between Pat and Mark about Miller Electric's uh, and use cases and environment. Absolutely welcome any questions you have throughout this event. Please use the chat or Q&A function in the WebEx browser uh, to submit any questions and we'll make sure to address those at the end of today's presentation. Uh, we've allocated one hour for this session and as mentioned, we are recording. So before I hand off to Pat to get us started, I wanna give a 60 second overview of Burwood Group for those on the call who may not be familiar with us. Uh, Burwood is an IT consulting and integration firm. We're headquartered in Chicago with employees and clients across the US. Our roots and expertise are in IT infrastructure, including collaboration technology. And today, what we spend most of our time on is helping our manufacturing clients to achieve balance between maximizing their existing investments and prioritizing new innovation like IoT progress, like cloud adoption. Uh, single wire and formcast is an industry leading mass notification system and absolutely an important piece of the puzzle. And we help our manufacturing clients design and implement a comprehensive collaboration infrastructure that can include many pieces and parts as you see represented on the screen here. So as you can see, we're excited to highlight the real life client perspective today with Mark from Miller Electric. And with that, I will hand it off to Pat to get us started. Take it away, Pat. Thanks, Colleen. So before we get really going into the, the main part, we wanted to have a, a quick poll question. We wanna just understand uh, where, where you're coming from. So uh, are you currently able to reach everyone in your organization with an alert during an emergency? So we'll give you just a, a moment to uh, respond to this question. And again, the basic idea here is we just want to understand, you know, where you all are coming from in terms of what you might have implemented and operating here today. Okay, so we'll give it just a, a moment for those results to come in. While we're waiting for those to come in, um, I'll tell you a little bit about SingleWire. So um, SingleWire software has been around since 2009, um, and our product has actually been around since 2001. We were spin out from another company, so that's how that worked. We're based in Madison, Wisconsin, although we have people all across uh, the country uh, and, and even uh, some in the UK. We have about 120 employees now and we have about 7,000 customers. So we've been at this quite a while. Um, we're very familiar with the different use cases that are out there in, in really all industries, but we do a significant amount of business in manufacturing. And that's why we're really happy to talk to Mark today. We'll be diving into that here in a moment. So that poll is closing and we'll see the results here momentarily. And we'll just, we'll just uh, share a little bit of information about what we're seeing in terms of uh, what you all are, are doing relative to emergency notification. 
Okay, and so the, the question was, are you currently using uh, emergency notification? Uh, are you currently able to reach everyone in your organization with an alert during emergency? And it's roughly evenly split. Yes, 44%, no, 56%. So that's not unlike what we really see in the, just in the general marketplace for what it's worth. Um, but we do see people looking to always improve, even if they have something. Um, and if they don't, they, you know, there's certainly a, a lot of interest, uh, particularly now with people being spread out because of the pandemic, remote worker notifications and so forth. So this is, these are some of the use cases that we see people coming to us for. And there has been a bit of a shift in this. I mean, prior to the pandemic, you wouldn't have seen the top two up there all that often. Um, you know, people really come to us for things that, uh, that are emergencies that they really have a real time crunch around. So very quick turnaround, things like active shooter, things like severe weather, tornadoes, and things like that. Because our hallmark is speed, reach, and intrusiveness. So it's those things that really matter. Now with the pandemic, you know, people being outside of facilities a lot more than they have been this past year, we've seen remote worker notifications really jump to the top. And we've seen health advisories, which really can also be a remote worker notification depending on the organization. But these are things like asking people if they're if they're healthy or not, attesting, um, getting a message confirmation back, attesting that a person is healthy before they come into the office and that sort of thing. I should say that that's what we see people coming to us for, but the content is whatever you want to make it. And you're gonna see here in very short order when we talk to Mark that they implemented at Miller Electric a number of really interesting use cases that certainly were not templates inside of the Informacast system. They built their own uh, and made that content what they want it to be to fit their particular environment. This is what we call our any to any slide. And what this shows are the things that we can trigger from on the left there in yellow and the things that we can send to in green on the right. And there's a couple of kind of unique things to point out here. One is that those triggers can be manual or they can be automated. So you can send an Informacast notification by hitting a button on a desk phone, on a mobile phone, um, a physical button, et cetera, or you can have an automated trigger. And you'll see some of those from Miller Electric where they tied into physical systems in their plant environment in order to make things safer. We also can tie to outside uh, information sources, things like the National Weather Service, um, things like um, on the West Coast, early earthquake warning. And then on the right-hand side, this is really a big part of our competitive differentiation. The ability to send not only to mobile devices, which everybody does in mass notification, everyone sends bulk SMS text messages. It's just, it's what people do. And that really is most of the way that people get in touch with people on mobile phones. We can, of course, send a push notification, but a lot of times people don't install the app. Uh, and we can call phones, but a lot of times people don't answer numbers that they don't recognize. And so SMS, notifications are really, really common. We do that like everyone else does. Where we come into play is sending to these on-premises devices. And we have some pictures from inside of the Miller Electric plant showing some of those devices that we sent to. We started out sending broadcast to IP phones, to specifically to Cisco phones. We now send to others as well. But the idea there is you, you, a lot of people have desk phones on everyone's desk. Uh, and to take those phones and not to call them, but to broadcast to them so that people don't have to pick up the phone and it automatically plays audio at the speaker phone, essentially turning every desk phone into an emergency notification speaker. That's how we started out uh, over 20 years ago now um, for the U.S. Department of Commerce and they, when they had to comply with uh, the Department of Homeland Security mandate that came out after 9-11. So that's, that's a big part of what we do sending to computer desktops, sending to existing overhead paging systems, and sending to other devices, even physically locking doors if your emergency happens to be a lockdown. So that's a real quick primer on, on what we're doing. I'm going to tell you two quick customer stories before we talk to Mark, just to kind of tie all this together when it comes to mass notification. We had a, a customer, a prospect, they were not yet a customer, that was um, the, a healthcare system in the upper Midwest. They had what they thought was an active shooter situation. It turned out there was a troubled young man who drove to their property, uh, parked in their parking lot, and then took his own life with a gunshot. But they didn't know what the gunshot was from at the time. They thought it was an active shooter situation. So they sent an alert out to their 30,000 staff that work at that campus. They did an after action survey, and it showed that people wanted to be notified based on whatever they were doing at the time of the incident. 
And the reason they sent the survey is a lot of people weren't notified and they were upset. So just take a step back. They they had a problem, wasn't wasn't solved with their existing emergency notification system. And they responded and said, I, I want to be notified on the overhead speaker if I'm in the skyway between two buildings. If I'm at my desk, I want a desktop pop up to come in front of my windows and, and alert me so that I, it draws my attention to it. And if they were off campus, they said, send me a text message. Well, of course, you don't know where you're going to be the next time something like that happens. You don't know what time of day these things are gonna happen. They're not scheduled, of course. And so it really just underscores that need to have multiple layers of notification. Now, this one is a, a case where there was a gunman in the community that is adjacent to the campus property at an SEC university. And that gunman ran through campus and they went to send out an alert and the campus police dispatch recognized that at that moment that it took longer for them to send the alert than it did for the incident to occur. Um, because the gunman ran through campus, ran all the way through and was into the community uh, outside of campus property before they were able to get the message out. And the reason is because like a lot of organizations, they had many different systems they had to send to. They had half a dozen different systems. They had a giant voice outdoor system that broadcasts audio out the speakers for the common areas that are outdoors. They had an SMS text messaging system. They had to update the university homepage. They wanted to send to Twitter. And they wanted to broadcast to their phones, their, their desk phones like we do, which they, they couldn't even do at the time before they had our system. So they wanted to combine all of that into one sending effort. And what we did is tied all that together. And then they had training and they scheduled an hour for the training. After five minutes, we'd sent three sample messages and they said, is, is there any more to this? And for them, because all they do in dispatch is send messages, the answer is no, that's it. And they say, well, that, all right, we're done. Because that's all we need to know is, is how to send. Um, and so again, it's sending one message that goes to those half dozen systems, as opposed to logging in to each system individually, creating the content and clicking send. All right, so we're gonna talk to Mark here very shortly, but before we do that, we're gonna have one more uh, poll question. And this is really about your internet of things alerting capabilities. So how comfortable are you with your current Internet of Things alerting capabilities? And so this is tying into those things typically in the physical environment. Um, when we talk to Mark, you're going to see the things that he's tied into in his plant environment. Could be things like temperature sensors, ammonia sensors, could be tying into existing access control systems or panic button type systems. Uh, or even tying into, again, some of those examples that we use, like the National Weather Service or early earthquake warning, gunshot detection, and so forth. So when we say IoT alerting, Internet of Things alerting, that's what we're referring to. All right. So now the main event, we're going to talk to Mark T Tilkins at uh, Miller Electric. And uh, we did a previous webinar with, with Mark this past fall. And going into that, Mark and I did a little bit of a prep call, of course, and just got an understanding of, of what all they were using Informacast for. And, and it was really interesting. And then we got on the call and I asked him the questions and we just found more and more use cases. They'd really, they'd really leveraged a lot of the capabilities with Informacast. And we said, you know, this is something we want to do again. So here we are um, with all of you today to, to do it all over again. And the reason, uh, again, is because I don't think they have any special uh, expertise, um, but they have some special use cases. And it really just illustrates how you can take Informacast into your environment and you can really use it uh, to better, uh, to, to receive better business benefits in the end. So with that, Mark, why don't you tell us a little bit about Mill Electric, where are you located, how many sites, how many people are working there, that sort of thing. Yep. Um... We are headquartered in uh, Appleton, Wisconsin. Um, we're the world's manufacturing leader of uh, welding equipment, arc welding equipment, and and uh, we've been here since 1929. We started. Uh, we're uh, we're owned by Illinois Toolworks as our parent company, so we're a subsidiary of them, and we have various. Um, other sister companies that are located throughout the United States that are all with 
within our network. And so altogether, we probably have uh, about 2,000 employees in Appleton and probably another couple thousand employees uh, scattered throughout the rest of the United States. And so in Appleton, I think we have like nine different buildings within a couple mile radius. And then from there, we've got locations, other manufacturing facilities in the rest of the country. Um, some of the locations are uh, warehousing distribution where they only got a couple employees, as well as uh, a couple training facilities that we have located throughout the country as well. Excellent. So let's move on to the, uh, the, the first alert that we're talking about here. Um, and why don't you just describe what it is we're looking at and, and what it is that, that you implemented there at Miller Electric? Sure. So um, when we got into InformaCast, um, we did the, the big alert notifications, which was a tornado, fire, and active shooter or active alert event going on. Uh, then we're kind of our targeted big three, and we quickly quickly found a couple other uh, unique scenarios. Um, the one we're showing on the screen here now, uh, during our manufacturing process, it's very important that certain torque uh, specifications are met. And we had a, a scenario pop up right away where uh, the overall pressure, the air pressure in the building would get to a low level and nobody was really monitoring that. So by the time a couple of these uh, components got to the end of the assembly line, they were effectively not torquing down the proper um, specifications. So what we did is there, they came to me and said, is there a way to, you know, you can do all this other neat stuff over the overhead paging system. Would there be a way to tell us when the overall building air compressor pressure levels dip to a certain level? And so we looked at it and it was a simple method of hooking up a dry contact closure to a air pressure gauge. And now we're able to alert with a, it's an audible alert that does a ding ding over the, over the PA system and it scrolls a message across a couple of message boards that we have out on the plant floor. And it was really well received right away that we did this. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. Especially what you led with there, what you, you said at the top is that you implemented InformaCast for some of these emergency use cases, active shooters, severe weather, and so forth. And that's a, 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 you know, certainly we looked at the use case slide earlier. It's what a lot of customers come to us for. Uh, and yet once you have it, it, it can tie into so many other things and some of the, the, uh, this workflow alerting. Um, in this case, um, like you said, the idea that if that thing isn't spec to the right PSI, that you're going to get an alert so that you're not putting bad product out. And I think that's a, it's just a really interesting use case and um, one that you you brought up uh, the last time we talked. Yep. All right, so let's take a look at the results of our second poll here. You can see that, uh, so again, this question was, how comfortable are you with your current IoT alerting capabilities? And we have 4% that said uh, not at all, 12% um, that said somewhat, 8% good, getting better, 8% dynamite, it's excellent, and 68%. Um, so we had, we, so yeah, so it, we had several non answers there. Um, maybe people are, um, hopefully they're still awake, but maybe they're just uh, embarrassed to, to rate themselves as to where they're at at this current point in time. Um, so I think that what we've seen, what, what you've done, I would put you as pretty advanced, Mark. That's obviously why we're showcasing what you've done at, at Miller Electric. But um, why don't you just talk to, on that last one, the in terms of tying the compressor system into InformaCast so that you get an alert when the PSI level drops. What was the level of difficulty of that implementation, that configuration um, between those two systems? It was very simple. I mean, we uh, 
we worked with our vendor who helped us install InformaCast. Uh, backing up a little bit, we, we were a Cisco phone system about seven years ago, and that's where we really started with InformaCast and SingleWire. We needed the, the 911 call aware piece of it. And probably about two years ago is where we, we had similar, similar cases where we had disjointed methods of uh, alerting people. Um, some of them were, you know, subscription-based um, texting services, uh, even down to some of our facilities had, you know, the manual air horn and they would wave a flag and say, you know, everybody's got to meet out in the parking lot at the flag. Um, so really about two years ago is when we we recognized the need across all our facilities to um, have a consistent and quick method to uh, alert everybody of, of things going on. Uh, one of our locations, they, they have a couple buildings within a couple mile radius and within them buildings, they had different different colors of strobes and different methods to alert a fire or or a tornado incident going on. And we found that it was even it was not even consistent within certain locations. So therefore, if a, a plant employee changed jobs and went from one building to another, they were confused at what to do. So we we simplified that consistent over all of all the locations and so when it came to implementation of the big three items that that went pretty quick um, and then when we went to devices like the low air pressure I mean literally that was come up with a contact closure and put a network cable to it in 30 minutes we had that kind of configured up and running so it's very straightforward yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good to know because I think a lot of times when people look at some of these IoT integrations, they're like, "Well, you know, what are we going to have to do to get that working? You know, are we going to have to we're going to have to hire third party app developers, or you know, if if you haven't done it, there might not be the visibility into what needs to be done. So in this case, yeah, contact closure is about as easy as it gets, right? It's binary; it's either open or it's closed, on off. Um, for for those who aren't familiar, the the most common contact closure is is your old school doorbell, um, which is, you know, when you press that, you're closing a contact, which makes it ring. Um, and in this case, just a, a contact closure gateway is used, which is a simple device that that has an ethernet cable on one side that connects it to the network so that we can talk to it. And out the other side are dry contact relays. So screw terminals that you put a pair of wires into and you connect it to the thing on the other end. Um, it is the, it's, so it's mechanical in terms of how it connects in. It's one of the simplest things out there in terms of uh, a, a way to integrate to a third party system. Um, so it's interesting that that's what it was um, because that, yeah, it's, it's very, uh, very easy to spin up. So um, tell us what we're, we're looking at here. Are those, those, the hoses hanging down from in front of um, that, uh, that line worker there, are those, uh, some of those are connected to torque tools there in yellow. Is that correct? Yep. Yep. Correct. There is just a, a simple example of uh, an assembly line that we have and in the, the hoses and torque tools, various tools and, and, uh, you know, pre previously they relied on a gate, a gauge and a maintenance guy kind of being in his area to watch that gauge. But we quickly, in that building, we found out that not, not everybody is sitting in one spot looking at a gauge. So being able to hear, a, it's just a polite ding ding over the overhead PA system. And then they know to look at these scrolling message boards. And, and that, that's all it took. Okay, all right, great. Now I find when I when I go out and on site, sometimes I'm there doing uh, network maintenance or something. And if I I uh, even to get the picture here for this uh, slideshow, I manually triggered that to picture, 
and within a minute of me manually triggering it somebody one of the line workers was coming up to me and he's like is everything okay and i'm like yep it's all okay so so they're trained right away to know what to look for yeah well uh, i used to say thanks for shutting down your line for a couple of minutes in order to get the picture <laughs> yep. that's great all right so tell us what you're what we're looking at here okay so this is another example of uh, an assembly line that we have and uh, we have several of these we make some louder engine drive uh, equipment and at the end of the assembly line they got to go through a test booth and so when it goes in that that soundproof enclosure booth um, they run the they run the product through a bunch of series of tests before it's certified to uh, be shipped so in the past, we would have, you know, the overhead paging system throughout the building and they, uh, if, an avert, if some sort of event was going on, it was uh, somebody's responsibility on the outside of the booth to grab the person who was working inside the booth. Uh, typically the guy inside the booth, he's in there working, running, running the, the engine drive motor it's loud like your lawnmower, and he's in there wearing ear muffs and everything and doing his job. And every, somebody was supposed to grab him and take him out of the building or let him know that something's going on. Well, we talked about that, and, and that's a good practice, but I think if there's something really going on drastically, somebody's going to, people are going to run, and they might forget the guy in the booth. So, so we came up with the um, a simple scenario where we could, at a strong light as well as a IP um, speaker, and we could simply add that inside the booth. So now we're not relying on on somebody to manually get the get the person. Um, the strobe light will go off, and we've got it configured in a way that even if they're general uh, page address messages, he will get them over that address speaker. And then if it's a, it's an override type of page, and if the strobe is blinking, um, then the override page will also come out that speaker. So that, that's been pretty well received and, and appreciated by the workers. Yeah, that's interesting. Another, another interesting use case, and you know, in this case, like you said, using both audio and visual alerting because you're in in an area people are it's loud people are wearing hearing protection and they're just not going to hear it if it were audio only in certain circumstances so this is one that was uh that was kind of a a, a new one um last time we talked uh, mark this this concept that you have uh an ice house um and and i think people who aren't in wisconsin like uh, you and I just happen to be coincidentally might be thinking, well, isn't every house in Wisconsin an ice house? And yeah, the True. short answer is yes, of course. Um, but um, you have something specifically called an ice house. So tell us about what we're looking at here. Yeah, so this is kind of unique uh, for our facility. Um, we have, it, I'm not sure of all the details of it. It's been around since the 1980s, but there was a a grant that was given to Miller Electric or something, um, and, and basically they created this uh, uh, what we call the ice house. But it's uh, the entire main plant assembly plant is cooled with uh, an, air, an air conditioning system, and I, I think I refer to it as a glorified um, slushy, like you buy at the uh, convenience store. And so all day long and all night long, they they use an ammonia uh, configuration and they make ice and they make ice in this building and then they pump this ice throughout the uh, the rest of the facilities. This is a view of inside the ice house. And there's very limited staff of people that are allowed in this building and and all the ammonia concentration is in this facility and only the um, the ice slushy solution is is pumped throughout the rest of the facility. So so anyway, there's pretty high concentrations of ammonia in here, and there's rigorous 
testing and, and everything that has to go on with the state and all that kind of stuff. But if there were to be um, a leak or an event that would happen like that, we needed a, a method to quickly alert people um, within the within our immediate facilities to take cover and not go outside, but to stay indoors. And, and then we have, as I mentioned, we have like eight or nine other buildings within a couple mile radius. And there's constantly employees and office people moving between facilities for meetings and what have you. So we felt not only is it important to be able to, with a click of a button, tell people to stay indoors, but also to tell other workers, hey, don't come to the main plant, there's there's something going on. So in this system, we even have it, uh, uh, we have some things in place to alert our, so we're good neighbors to some of the companies around us as well, to let them people know to let their employees to stay indoors too. So, so this was a uh, another method that we were able to easily configure in FormerCast to, to do alerting. And, and what we're looking at here is the web um, dashboard that you can log into, into InformaCast and, and you can set this up and configure it real easily. Um, this happens to be my login. So you see a little more detail than what our normal uh, safety personnel type of people see, but they're able, we're, this is called their command center, and you're able to quickly set up these tiles, and there's templates all built behind these tiles. So they can, they can log into here and click a button, and that's it. it everything, takes, everything takes place right after that button is clicked. Um, this is available on a, as a mobile app on your smartphone as well. It looks very similar. And with a click of a button, you can initiate initiate these things. So, so the one in the center there, the emergency ammonia uh, Spencer Street, that's the one that they would use to trigger. We don't have anything automated. Our, our safety people wanted to make that call or, you know, they meet as a group to determine if the uh, levels are high enough that that they would need to initiate this event. So that's how that works. Yeah, that, that's interesting. Um, this ammonia is particularly dangerous. I think most people recognize that, right? You, you, the concentration is high enough. You, when you breathe it in, you can have some really serious uh, problems up to and including death. And, um, you know, being a uh, being in the dairy state, we have a lot of dairy producers, ice cream, and we have, we first learned about this several years ago from uh, uh, an ice cream manufacturer that has ammonia sensors on the plant floor. And the issue they were having was that the ammonia sensor would go off in a, just in a particular local area of the, of the plant. The plant's seven football fields large. And that would notify people in the immediate area and they would know to move away. But ultimately, you would have someone on a forklift driving from one end of the plant to the other that did not hear the ammonia sensor go off in that local area and would drive and could potentially drive right through the ammonia cloud. And now you've got breathing problems, a workers' comp claim, et cetera. And so they tied theirs directly into InformaCast. Um, and so it's it's automated. But that what you what you say is interesting. We see people do this with something that everyone can relate to, and that's weather notifications. Um, and it, this gets to more of a process or procedure question versus a technical one. And that is, when do you want human intervention to make a judgment call as to whether an alert should go out versus when do you want to automate that? And, and clearly you've done both, right? With your, with, your, um, uh, with your air compressor, with your torque tools, you're, you're looking at that being automated and with with ammonia, you're doing it manually. And with with weather, we see sometimes people, if they're especially if they're tying directly into the National Weather Service, they might have, if it's a tornado um, watch, they'll have that go to the safety team and they will watch it. If it's a tornado warning, um, because they can't always count on someone seeing that immediately, or maybe they don't have safety staff that are there all three shifts, 
um, they will have the warning message be an automated trigger and will go out to the notification system without any human intervention. So we do see people treating those things a little bit differently depending on the scenario, but I think it's just worth talking about. And ultimately it comes down to a particular organization and making a, a judgment call as to whether they want that to be an automated or a, you know, a human intervention trigger. Yeah, that that's how we kind of got into this. I, I being the IT guy, I was kind of pushing it more, but the, I could tell the safety and facilities people were a little more hesitant to get on the bandwagon of this <laughs> when we first started implementing it. Um, you know, when it came to tornado drill, or, or I should say tornado, we are using the National Weather Service feature and we're keying off of, uh, if it's a warning, uh, we go ahead and we send the message and the system is automated and just does it. And so after, after that happened a few times because we've had them and people were like, wow, that, that was pretty impressive. And they didn't have to rely on somebody listening to a weather radio to make that judgment call to initiate that. So, so then when it came to fire, uh, fire was always a, a hesitation. Do we really want something automated kicking this sort of thing off? And we do a we do a method here where um, if you're the immediate building is going to get paging and, and overhead paging and everything like that, but basically everybody in the Appleton area is going to receive an email and an SMS text when there's a fire happening at one of our nine buildings here in Appleton. So that was, a, if, to put automation behind that, people were a little hesitant, but after they learned and how, how the tornado went happened, then our facility and safety people kind of came back at me and said, this is a must. We, it's good to have a manual method to initiate a fire but, you know, let's take the manual element out of it. And so we've been, recently we've tied in all our, all our panels with contact closures and that just, it automatically happens. Gotcha. Yeah, it's really interesting. So, you know, just get, really just extending that notification capability because clearly, you know, regardless of what jurisdiction you're in, you're, if there's a fire, fire system in the building is gonna notify people, but it's also really helpful to know not to go near that building if there's uh, if there's a fire, and that's really what you're letting people know about in this case. All right. So tell us what we're we're looking at here. Talks about a, a conference call for your critical incident management team. Correct. So another side benefit that we didn't even really realize was there when we first purchased InformerCast. But it um, within our IT group, there's probably 18, 18 to 20, some of us, uh, a lot of us located in Appleton, but uh, the rest of our IT team is, is scattered throughout the United States. And so having, having a, an IT incident, say the email system is down or the phone system is down or, or something like that, um, we needed a quick way to on the fly, uh, set up a conference call bridge type of situation that everybody could dial into. So it's a, a quick thing that we were able to set up. InformerCast is all set to do it. And we put everybody in that group and we provide our, our uh, team of people these instructions. And, and as long as it's posted on a bulletin board within our conference rooms or every individual in our IT department has this kind of with them. They can, it doesn't matter time of day or night, they can initiate a conference bridge. And when they, when they dial this and they initiate it, um, an email and a text SMS goes out to everyone. And it's real simple. You can, you can click on it and, and you're, everybody's brought into this conference and then we can quickly talk about what the what the incident is and who's going to work on what and and then if a, if it's an ongoing thing, the bridge number stays the same and we can just keep rejoining it. So so after we did this, we've we've actually used it and tested it a number of times and 
hands down, this was this was a, a huge win for our department. Everybody, yeah, it's, everybody I, enjoys it. Yeah, that's good. It's it's really interesting, you know. Especially when you talk about like an out of band way to communicate, you know, when maybe some of your primary systems are the very ones you're that are that are down and you need to have the incident about. So um, this is hosted in the cloud. And so, you know, it, it's going to work regardless um, of anything that might be happening um, within your IT environment. Um, I should just mention that for those people that are, you know, we're all very familiar with using, we're using WebEx right now. So people using WebEx or using Microsoft Teams, that we do have the ability to trigger one of those meetings as well, um, or to, to notify people to join a meeting there too, if, if, they're, um, if they wanna do that. The nice thing about the conference call capability is, um, is that if you wanna be audio only, it's just really simple. And then also, if you're looking at having people join that aren't part of your organization, you know, maybe they don't have a, an account uh, on your WebEx or an account on your Teams. And um, so if you were, for example, if there were outside safety professionals, maybe law enforcement or fire or something like that, you wanted them to join uh, re about a particular type of incident, um, a conference call is just really simple there as well. So um, that's, what we, that's what we were able to do with it. Some of, some of the people, depending on the incident, if it's a cyber related incident, there are people from some outside companies and our corporate company that that needed a method to be included into this. So it, it worked really well. So the fact that our corporate company was impressed with what we came up with. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a really nice use case. Um I should just mention as we're as we're getting about three quarters of the way through the hour here, um, that we very much welcome questions for Mark or, or for me. Um, you can go ahead and enter those in the Q&A panel. We'll be getting to those in just a couple of minutes here. Um, really one last question for you, Mark, and that is, is do you have plans to, to tackle any other use cases? Like what's next for you as it relates to mass notification? Yeah, the um, as I mentioned, we just finished up the automation with the fire panels. Um, the next one that we we're going to work on was some of the call boxes. We do have these uh, under the desk panic button type of things. So that is kind of an area that we're looking at next. Um, the the um, certainly work from home and in, in the pandemic has has changed uh, quickly how how we were looking at using. Informacast. So during the early start of the pandemic, we were able to uh, quickly tweak some templates, and and that was well received by our operations people because, uh, as you mentioned in some of your earlier slides, to uh, quickly be able to communicate. And I see that continuing to happen. And and it, you know, it was like it, even from a, a early on when we talked about it, it was like, oh, let's just have a quick way to alert employees about, you know, snow snow situations, we're going to close the plant today, that kind of thing. Well, now they've used it for, you know, hey, um, first shift's not going to work because there was uh, an exposure at such and such a building. So they, they have a way, easy way to communicate with employees and tell them that, you know, they're not, not to report to work tomorrow. So it's been, been very flexible. So we, we continue to develop and make easy templates and scenarios for, for that kind of thing. Great, great. Yeah, again, so I'll just put a call out there for um, for anyone who wants to ask a question of, of Mark about you know, what they've been able to do in terms of affecting some of these use cases there at Miller Electric, go ahead and uh, punch that into the Q&A panel. Um, so let's go ahead and ask one last poll question here while we're waiting for some questions to come into Q&A. Um, are you using one system for both emergency alerting and workflow alerting? So again, simple yes, no. And the idea here is just that like, like we talked about and like what we've seen Mark um, put into place there at Miller Electric and Appleton, um, where they acquired the system or emergencies, things like active shooter, workplace violence, severe weather, and so forth. And yet they've tied into all these other systems. They're um, uh, sending out an ammonia alert, tying into the, 
the air torque tool compression system, the fire alarm system, uh, and so on. Um, so it's really the, the idea that it's a notification system and it can be used for emergencies, it can be used for workflow. And so we're just curious, um, are, are you, the audience, um, using your notification system for both emergencies and for workflow? If I can jump in on this note, we have had a question come in that's related to that poll. Um, can Informacast be integrated with other MESS notification systems if I'm using something already? The answer is probably, um, without knowing which system, the answer is probably. Um, so there are a couple of different flavors of Informacast, one that only sends to on-premises devices and then another, which Mark is using, that sends to both on-premises and mobile devices. If, if you have that second system, which we call Informacast Fusion, um, then there's really not a need to have another notification system, but we could still tie into it. And, and we understand that there are reasons people might want to do that. Maybe they have a lot of time and effort invested in uh, a mobile mass notification system, and they, they look at Informacast and say, we just want to use it for the on-prem stuff. You can certainly do that. And there are a number of ways to tie them together. Um, there's an emerging standard, not so much emerging in the sense that the standard has been around a while called CAP, the Common Alerting Protocol. What's emerging is, is that more and more people are supporting it such that um, you can use that to connect two of these types of systems together. That's probably the most common way we see doing that. That's how we are able to get um, NOAA, National Weather Service Alerts, for example, is using CAP. All right, so I, I, I already talked about this one as we were talking about the ice house and the ammonia um, tie-in. So this is one where we have a you know, very large ice cream manufacturing uh, customer. They tied their ammonia sensors directly into Informacast so that now everyone gets an alert instead of just the people in the immediate area. Um, and that's, uh, that's very heavily used. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and let's close that, that uh, poll. And, um, and again, go ahead and ask questions of Mark. This is your opportunity these last 10 minutes or so. Um, so again, the question was, are you using one system for both emergencies and for workflow alerting? And looks like um, it's roughly an 80-20 split with 80% saying they are not using one system today and 20% saying they are. So it's a, an interesting result, not unexpected, you know, where most people, especially if you have a traditional, what I would call a traditional notification system, which is really cloud-based sending to mobile devices and probably not much more, um, then there's not as much opportunity to tie into those things in the physical environment like we see um, Mark has done at Miller Electric. All right, we're gonna talk about um, Real quick, one more case study while we have a few more questions come in. And um, this is, this is I, I can mention the name here. This is Joy Global p &H Mining. They did a video case study. It's on our website. And, um, they had an issue where there was a plant worker on the manufacturing floor. And it's a huge manufacturing floor. They make the really big strip mining equipment that can't be used in this country, but is used in places like Brazil. And so like one gear can be like 20 feet across, just a huge plant environment. The guy, going into cardiac arrest, a plant worker was able to get to a pole where a phone was hanging and dial 911 and then he collapsed. Well, before EMS could even arrive on this massive property, the people working the guard shack saw that 911 had been dialed. And because they were using this call aware feature inside of Informacast, they knew where 911 had been dialed from. And so they were able to run out there and they were able to grab the defibrillator off the wall and shock him back to life before EMS even arrived on the property. So it just shows you that seconds really matter and that um, having multiple layers of notification is important. Now, of course, E911 would have told EMS where that person was located, right? But before they could even arrive on the property, internally, they knew, their own people knew that 911 had been dialed, they knew where it had been dialed. So they were able to get there and those, those seconds in their estimation really mattered in terms of saving that plant worker's life. So this one is a little bit unique. This is this company Technip is in France. They're an oil and gas services company and their SMS is not 
all that reliable. And, and frankly, in some places in the US, it's not that reliable either. And that could be based on how your buildings are constructed and people working uh, in um, below ground areas, or it could just be in a rural area where SMS could be spotty or, or what have you. Um, and so in this case, they said, you know, we need to reach everyone in our organization. Plus we have a lot of contractors that come and go. And so we wanna give them the ability to, to receive alerts and they decided to do that through Microsoft Teams, pushing these alerts out through Microsoft Teams, which is one of the integration methods that we have. And that was their way of really working around these SMS limitations. All right, so we're really at, uh, at the end of our uh, content here. So do we have any other uh, questions to cover? I do have a couple that have come in, Pat. Uh, so let me... Get into this. Uh, looks like probably a good one for Mark. Uh, question about the unique use cases you mentioned, like the strobe light, the low pressure alert. Um, are these ideas mostly coming from your workers and end users, kind of like seeing the emergency alerts and then coming up with these on their own? Or are you guys intentionally brainstorming on the IT side of new use cases? How are you coming up with these unique um, scenarios? Yeah, the, the low pressure alert was, um... Our workers on the floor, um, they're, they're constantly coming up with a lot of different questions. <laughs> so uh, they actually came up with it and working with my uh, reseller, we kind of brainstormed it together a little bit and, and that's what we came up with. And so a lot of these things are, that I encourage that the most, it's being able to partner with a vendor and and ask for the plant workers. I mean, they're the ones that are out there doing this stuff. And and so, you know, thinking outside of the box, it, it was uh, highly encouraged. It, it, they come up with all kinds of ideas. So it's, some, of them, some of them we look into and it's like, no, we can't do that or we shouldn't do that, but yeah. Yeah, and on a related note, have another question. Is there anything you've tried to use it for that hasn't worked? Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of, we recently had one, the uh, 911, because we're using the call aware, just like in that mining example, we're doing a 911 call and the we have a we have internal uh, first responder teams as well, and so in this particular case, it happened a while back. But in this particular case, they wanted if somebody dialed for an internal, if they dialed a certain override page, it's a it's a code with a pin that we make people dial, and we have it posted on our phones, and they they're like you know the team of first responders report to this area. And they wanted that to automatically, through a script, kick off a 911 call. And and we looked at that and we talked about it quite a bit. But I don't think I don't think it was uh, something we wanted to automate calling 911 because I think I think you want to have a live person calling the 911, talking to the operators, and giving them more information. So so that was an idea that somebody came up with, and they just like, can we script this and and have an automated robocall type of thing go to a 911 center. And we kind of frowned on that idea. <laughs> Interesting. Not, not that it's not capable of doing it, it's just procedurally we didn't want to go that way. Sure. Okay, uh, and we have another one coming in, I think maybe one for Pat. Uh, can this system be integrated with, let's say, a power provider? Yes, um, yeah, it, it certainly can. Um, in terms of like if, if power were to be cut in some place that we could get a notification out to people. Um, yes, that, that is that is something we can do either typically through, a, you know, a contact closure. Um, as we mentioned, that's kind of the lowest common denominator on mechanical things. Um, or if you have some sort of monitoring software that's more intelligent, you can do it the software layer and can either send us um, you know, there's a lot of ways to, to trigger inbound to inform a cast from an external system, um, email, um, the API, um, RSS, or CAP, any of those would be 
would be workable. Great. Okay. Uh, and then one other, I know you touched on this in one of your last use cases, Pat. Uh, does Informacast comply with E911 regulations? Yeah, so Informacast itself is not a full E911 system. What we're doing is internal alerting that, that 911 has been dialed. So um, if you're looking at a true E911 system, which sends that location information out to the PSAP, um, that is not what we, we do. There are other systems like Red Sky, for example, that are, are really purposeful to do that. Got it. Okay, uh, well, that comes to the end of the questions we've received. So I think that's about it. Uh, and we are just about at the end of the hour. So why don't we go ahead and wrap up unless um, Pat or Mark, any final words of wisdom or thoughts? Well, just thanks to everyone for their time and attention today. I hope you found this helpful. Great, thank you both for being here with us today. Uh, so we'll go ahead and wrap. Thanks to everybody for joining, listening, asking some great questions. As I mentioned, we'll send out the recording link via email. Uh, on the last slide will pop up here. You'll see our contact info. Would love to hear from any of you if you're interested in trialing this, asking more questions about the tool, how it could work for your specific facility. I know um, Pat, Mark certainly are happy to answer any questions you may have. Please connect directly with us. Um, lastly, as soon as you close this webinar out today, you'll see a survey pop up in your browser from Cisco WebEx. We would be glad to um, get your feedback on how this was helpful to you, uh, future webinar topics. Please take a moment to fill out the survey, just a couple of questions, and it helps us improve our next event. So with that, um, I'll go ahead and wrap this up. Thank you again so much, Mark, for your time and joining us today. Thanks, Pat, for facilitating this event, and thank you all for joining. Have a great afternoon. Thank Bye. you.